I guess I hit it a little early. That's all right. You're on, honey. Honey, you're on. I know, but there's nobody there. Hello, Danny. So far, it's just you and I. Well, I guess there's five people in here. So we'll let some people come in here. If you hit that uh, thumbs up, and uh, that way I know that there's people here. We got six people here, four people. Somebody left. All right. What I want to do, and, and we'll wait to get started a little bit until we get some more people in here. I know John's having a live, and so maybe there's a bunch of people over there. Uh, might be a little sparse tonight then. But um, what I want to do is, um, well, that's all right. Play with the little dude. That uh, He needs your time. What I want to do is just kind of talk about the video that we that I did uh, this week, what I posted. And hey, Pete, you got both of us on. All right, well that's fair. Um, yeah, what I want to do is just talk a little bit about the video that I did last week, and maybe answer questions if if people watched it and they've got something to comment on, something to add, or something to take away from it. Um, if you haven't seen it, it was just a video on genetically modified organisms. And one of my pet peeves about the, the food world, the gardening world, whatever you want to, however you want to look at it, is that there's a lot of myths, there's a lot of untruths, there's a lot of half-truths, there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of uh, dishonesty, and there's, you know, like everything else in life, there's people who just don't take the time to really um, investigate things. They don't take the time to look look things up and do the research for themselves. And so, I thought I'd put together a little bit of research and see if I could put something out there would help start a conversation about genetically modified food. I actually think that there's a lot of promise behind GMOs. Um, I don't really, in the literature that I've read, I don't see a whole lot of problems or drawbacks to them. Um, I see a lot of fear mongering amongst certain people, small groups of people who maybe are politically or financially motivated to restrict or limit hydroponics, or not hydroponics, I'm sorry, I'm looking at Danny's name and um, can't think of anything but hydroponics. Uh, but, you know, I think there's a kind of a, a movement to sort of limit what, what we have available to us. And uh, GMOs can be a really powerful tool. Yeah, GMOs seem scary because we talk about we're modifying genes, but we've been doing that for 3,000 years. We've been modifying genes through line breeding. And when you line breed, you really don't know what the outcome is going to be. You take two plants that have, um, and you, you modify some of the DNA in those plants. And what you, what you end up with is... Um, Maybe you're taking the positive characteristics. Maybe you're taking the negative characteristics. But when you do genetic modification, uh, you destroy only the proteins responsible for the things you want to eliminate. And you can add in proteins for the characteristics that you want to increase. And it 
it really isn't. I mean, once they, in 1985, they unlocked the DNA chain, the code. They finished breaking the code. And from there on, they just simply had to look at how those proteins work together and what proteins to take out. I think the scariest thing about GMOs, in my opinion, is that the seed companies that are making the GMOs are not going to make GMO everything. And so you're, you're going to have maybe one type of GMO cabbage and one type of GMO. Well, you probably have several GMO tomatoes, but uh, over time, you're going to lose if we gravitate towards the GMOs and we only have one of each type or maybe we don't even get every type, we limit the diversity in the, uh, in the soil and we, we limit the diversity of the plants. So to me, that's the scary part of GMOs. And other than that, you know, it, it's really, we, we graft trees onto stronger root and we line breed plants together. It's really just more of the same thing. So, you know, and the other part of it is if you stop and just look at it from an experience, best yet journey, welcome. I appreciate you coming to the channel. So if, if you look at GMOs, and you look at the history of them. Now, we've been uh, GMO cotton and GMO corn, GMO soybeans have been around, as well as eggplant, um, you know, BT eggplant, golden rice, I'm missing a couple, papayas. Um, they have been around for over 20 years. It's not really new technology. There have been zero deaths related to genetically modified organisms. There have been zero allergic reactions uh, connected to genetic modified food. Um, we've had no, you know, the, the one of the big fears back in the 70s when they, or uh, 80s when they started talking about doing this, one of the fears was that those plants would go out and multiply and crossbreed and create these uh, dinosaur plants, you know, and, and we'd have Jurassic Park in our gardens kind of thing. But genetically modified organisms won't crossbreed any more than a non-GMO. Uh, the fact of the matter is, the only way you'd know it was a GMO is if you knew it was genetically modified. Uh, you can't even tell with a microscope. You can't even tell by analyzing the fruit afterward because there's just no difference in the actual fruit. I think biodiversity is the big uh, scary point to me. Uh, there's some great positives. One of the great positives is that in some of the third world nations, there's a better word for that. I don't mean to be insulting in any way, but in developing nations, you've got farmers who their personal health is increasing greatly because with BT ready crops, they're not spraying any pesticides. They're not having to spray anything on their fields. They're saving money. They're making more money. They're getting better yields. They're not having the, the bull, uh, they're not bull weevil, they have bull weevils in the cotton. And so because of that, uh, they're getting much better yields. Suicide rates among farmers in developing nations have gone down significantly. Crop yields in developing nations have increased by 37% by the, through the use of GMOs. And so we look at it and we say, yeah, you know, it, we're messing with nature. But we've been messing with nature for 3,000 years. This is just newer technology. 
Do I think we need to be careful? Of course. I think we need to be careful when we go out to our garden and we plant seeds in our garden. Tell you a quick, um, quick story. This is a true story. There's a garden. It's about four miles from my farm. And when I say garden, they're about, I think they're about 24 acres of mixed vegetables. And then they're about 80 acres of sweet corn. So it's, it's not a garden, it's a farm. But the manager of that farm, she's 20 years experience working on the, on that farm. She grew up on her father's farm and now she's moved on to, she's got her own um, market farm going. They're running about 12 acres. Hey, Swafford Homestead, welcome. Thank you for coming out. Um, but you talk about making a bad mistake. She was going through the Johnny's catalog, and she came across a plant called purslane. And she bought seeds, and they planted purslane. Now, purslane, in my opinion, is the third most invasive weed in my garden. It's edible. And um, I know people enjoy eating it. That's why they have that um, seed available at Johnny's. Nobody's going to buy it if it isn't edible. Uh, it tastes okay. I've, I've even picked the wild stuff that, that we grow and picked it. But last year in my cucurbits, I probably could have taken 15 bushels a week of purslane out of the field. It's extremely invasive. And she planted it. So I think anytime we do anything in the garden, we have to do our research. We have to make sure that we're not making the mistake of planting something that's going to eventually cause us a lot of work or cause us a lot of headaches. So with that in mind, I think GMOs we need to take, um, I think we need to take a lot of time to, to do research. Uh, best yet, Journey says, I have it in my yard too. You know, anywhere where you have uncovered ground, anywhere where you have dirt, and I think it grows pretty much everywhere, you're going to have purslane. Mint is a problem too, but mint, at least in my experience, I can hoe mint out. And if I hoe it out, I'm not going to get it back for four or five weeks, maybe even the rest of the season. If I hoe purslane out, but I don't pick the plants up and actually carry them out, I'm going to have purslane again. And it's going to come back thicker each time. And, um, you know, you fight this stuff long enough and, and you start to get careful about it. So we got about seven people here. Anybody want to venture a guess as to what the first genetically modified food was? The first genetically modified vegetable? And I'll keep babbling and waiting. If somebody wants to venture a guess, that's fine. Um, but when we look at the, the benefits to GMOs, I think they far outweigh the drawback. So then you have to ask, uh, broccoli, no. Watermelon, no. Hey, redneck, doing redneck things. Welcome to the to the live. Um, no, potato. Actually, potato is one of the most successful. Um, there's there's been two genetic modifications to potatoes. One is to cut down the solanine levels in potatoes so that you don't get the the browning. Um, in fact, we would have had solanine uh, GMO potatoes a lot quicker, but people began to uh, pick it, and, and McDonald's was sponsoring the research, and they pulled out of the research because so many people were complaining. Um, Danny says uh, papayas. Papayas are one of the most important GM crops, especially if you're in Hawaii, because it gets rid of that that uh, virus, the ring virus uh, that papaya has. And I think papaya was the first successfully marketed um, direct to market vegetable uh, with uh, GM, but it wasn't the first one they tried. 
the first one that they tried, Hello MB Heritage Farms, we, we got a little contest, no prizes involved, well, bragging rights, and those are big. Uh, what was the first genetically modified vegetable, or at least the first attempt at modifying a vegetable? Oh, can't take, well, that's all right. So the answer is tomato. There was a, an attempt to make a tomato that was, it was called, I think it was called a, um, an ever fresh or something along that line tomato. And the reason it failed is because it tasted terrible. Um, the, the idea was that it could sit on the shelves a lot longer. It wouldn't spoil, it wouldn't go bad and it. And it didn't, but it had very little taste and what little taste it had um, nobody liked. So just open it up if if anyone has a comment that they'd like to put uh, either based on the video that I show I put up last Sunday or anything anything else, a question or a comment about GMOs or about anything really, feel free to put it in the uh, in the comments. So today, I received this in the mail. Um, it is uh, one of my one of my favorite books. It's the Johnny Seed Catalog, and sometimes when I'm at market and nobody's around, nobody's buying, I just sit and look through the seed catalogs. But um, this year, I've decided that I'm going to buy my seeds from Haas Tools because they were generous enough to sponsor Shed Wars and, and give us some seeds for prizes last year. Not sure what's happening this year, if they're still sponsoring or not, but I'm going to be buying from Haas Tools. Uh, Micro Farmer is doing an interesting um, test, I guess, or experiment on his farm or in his garden. He's got several raised beds and he's going to plant the same things, uh, Haas Tool seeds, and then next to it, he's going to plant from the big box store. Eric Hill, thank you for coming out. How are you? We're talking genetically modified organisms and really anything else uh, that you want. Yeah, MB Heritage makes a good point. John at Will It Grow has a affiliate link with Haas Tools. So you can go on there and just click his link and then anything you buy on there, John gets some credit for. And he has pledged to use that for... Um, to further shed wars and, and to uh, maybe provide prizes for the gladiator challenges or something of that nature. Um, so I'm going to move on. We can come back to the GMO topic if, if you're interested in it. Um, well, just one other thing. I started to say this, and then I got caught up into something else. Um, so far, there has not been a single report of anyone who has been uh, made sick, injured, or had an allergic reaction to any gen genetically modified organisms. Not, nothing at least official, nothing in the literature. But if we look at organic farming in general, uh, one of the things that we have, because we don't, we aren't careful, particularly with some of the organic fertilizers and um, compost tea is something you need to be very careful with. I, I will never do a video, or at least I don't ever intend to do a video on making compost tea um, because 
it is extremely dangerous if you're not careful when you make your compost tea. If you get any protein-based compost in it that hasn't been composted well, you could very well get bacterias into that uh, compost tea. And they've had several national recalls, particularly of lettuces, because of uh, improperly used compost tea. So Eric Hale says, the only GMO vegetable seeds I know you can buy is sweet corn. You got to sign papers to get it. You do. The papers that you have to sign. Now, we get uh, GMO dent corn. There's GMO cotton is very common. GMO eggplant is one of the newer ones. And uh, it's not, I, I know they commercially farm it in the U.S., but you're not going to, I don't think you're going to find it in a seed catalog. Um but the uh, the new thing coming out is the G, the BT potatoes, and I'm really excited about the opportunity to get BT potatoes. There was a um, it's a university study, and I, I wish I could tell you where it was. I think it was Pennsylvania, where they developed a BT ready potato. Now this is a potato that has Bacillus thuringiensis, not in it, but it creates it. Bacillus thuringiensis is a bacteria that doesn't affect the potato. It doesn't affect beneficial insects when it's generated from the potato. So I don't know all of the details about how all of that works, but when the Bacillus thuringiensis is in the plant, Beneficial insects don't chew the plants. They only uh, take the pollen, and the pollen does not contain the Bt. Bt does not go up into the flower. That's why organically we can use, we can spray Bt on plants. When you spray Bt on plants, you will kill anything it hits. So if you spray a, um, if you spray a beneficial bee, uh, a honeybee or a bumblebee or one of the other beneficials, it's going to die. Uh, there's, it's not maybe, it's, it's going to die. And um, so the idea that the potato can create its own BT is, has a great benefit, but it also prevents the spraying of the herbicide. So I don't have to use a diesel that it requires to spread that herbicide. Now, all around me every year, three times, four times a summer, we have crop dusters, whether it be helicopters or, um, you know, wing planes. Uh, they're crop dusting these fields and the amount of fuel that they use, the amount of carbon that they put out. So BT ready field corn which is also available. It's, I don't think, I haven't found anything that says it's available in the U.S., but it's being used in developing nations. India uses it. Uh, I, I believe I read that it's available in Australia. And so by not spraying the BT, we're not killing the beneficials with it. And we're not putting all of that um, carbon into the ozone. So it's, it's not all good, but there's a lot of good to it. There's a lot of good to it. Um, Danny, you take care. Take care of those kids. Thank you for dropping by. Yeah, we love the crop dusters too, Eric. You, uh, the only thing that always concerns me, and, and it also amazes me, we're right in the middle. And I swear to you, those planes sometimes touch and go off the edge of my silo. So I'm always concerned that they're overspraying, which is one of the reasons why I, um, I don't try to be organic, because I, I think it would be kind of a kind of a lie to say I was organic because I'm sure I'm getting drift. 
But what's interesting is they'll spray those fields and I'll still have aphids on my plants five feet off of their field. They won't have any on theirs, but I'll still have some on mine. So I think they're pretty precision. They use fairly large droplets coming out of the, the plane so that they drop straight down and don't get a lot of drift. They watch the, um, they watch the, the wind speeds and the directions. So they don't want to waste any of that. Um, there's an interesting website uh, or channel on YouTube. I wish I could give you the name of it, but you know, you, I watch so many of these uh, channels and, but they talk about how much pesticide they actually use on their fields. Now, remember when we talk about pesticides, it can be an insecticide. It can be an, you know, for, for insects, it can be, um, a nematide for nematodes, it can be a herbicide for weeds, it can be an apicide for ants and, and crawlies. Uh, any of those asides are all part of the pesticides. And um, so how much pesticide do they actually use? And for example, with um, carbaryl, which is, it, it, if you went to the big box store, you'd buy it under the name Seven. Uh, a, a tablespoon of carbaryl in an acre of crops. So you're not looking at that much. Hey, Tin Can, tin can Gardener, how are you? Thank you for coming by. So if you, you know, you're looking at a teaspoon per acre, it, it's a pretty small amount. But if we can even eliminate that by having the crops protect, uh, develop their own protection, um, it's perfect. I read, I, I was noticing, well, Eric says, I had a drift uh, two years ago, burned down a big turnip patch. Yeah, um, wow, it burned down turnips. That's got to be fairly, fairly strong. Deborah's Delicious Dishes, thank you for coming by. I appreciate you being here. Um, I, I, th I think what we have to start to understand when we talk about modified seeds is that there's a lot of negative hype about it. And I think I just want to keep hammering down that the BT modified cotton has saved lives, lots of lives. So if we look at just that one thing, just BT ready cotton, now not in the United States necessarily. You know, in the United States, our farmers are a lot wealthier. They may not be rich people, but they're a lot wealthier than farmers in developing nations. Uh, people in Bangladesh, for example, are still using the same kind of equipment that my grandfather might have used. Not my grandfather who had a dairy farm, but my grandfather who lived in the city and grew some beans out back. They don't have uh, the advanced mechanical equipment and so the BT crops and the Roundup Ready crops, and I know that's a terrible one, right? The Roundup Ready crops, they're saving them thousands and thousands of hours of work to losses. You know, anybody who's ever gardened has gone out, planted the seeds, cultivated, and either because of too much rain, too little rain, some kind of a pest, whether it be aphids, potato bugs, uh, root knot nematodes, uh, maybe it's not even that, maybe it's some kind of a fungus like a, a, a blossom end rot, something of that nature. You say, all my work, all my effort, wasted. Uh, Sandy and I had one year, we, we planted, everything. 
we started the process. We were cultivating. Things were going great. And then we had weeks, weeks where we didn't have two days without rain. The entire month of, of uh, June and July, we just had rain after rain. after, And you can't get in. You can't get the weeds out. The redroot amaranth, the water hemp, the purslane, all of that stuff just took over. We even had thistles. We never have thistles. And so by the time we were able to get in and get that stuff out, it was a total loss. We, we were able to garden out of there enough food for ourselves, but we had nothing to sell. And, um, you know, when I think about what seed costs, um, we had nothing to sell. Getting back, though, to something that we started on earlier and I got sidetracked, we talked about that you have to sign paperwork to plant um, GMO crops. So you have to sign paperwork to plant hybrid crops also commercially. When you're planting hybrid uh, dent corn, for example, or hybrid sweet corn, you have to sign a contract that says that you will not save seed to reuse next year, and you will not save seed to distribute to your neighbors so that they can uh, plant next year. And the reason why you have to sign those papers is because millions of dollars were spent on research and development. And if they didn't require you to contractually buy those seeds every time you went to plant them, they'd have to charge you for all of that R&D in the beginning. And no one would ever be able to afford that first crop of GMO seeds. So really, when you think about a contract like that, uh, from a from a grower's perspective, it really isn't the company saying, you can't save seeds. It's the company saying, look, you have to pay us for the seeds. And so you're going to pay us over a course of many years. Now, eventually those patents will uh, wear out. And when they do, uh, then you'll be able to save those seeds and you'll be able to re replant. Now, in the case of Roundup Ready Corn, those patents are uh, going to be coming up, I think it's 2025. Whether they're able to renew the patents or not is yet to be seen. But uh, their Roundup Ready Corn is probably not going to be the answer in 2025 because the, the weeds that we're killing with the Roundup are becoming resistant to the Roundup. And I want to make a little bit of a comment on, on glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup. We talk about Roundup being found on the food in the grocery store. So uh, there's been a lot of tests. The EPA does random, uh, not the EPA, the um, Department of Agriculture does random samples on the food that is available in, in the grocery store. And they're looking for the amount of pesticide that is a residual pesticide. Now, all of this pesticide all of the herbicide is going to be on the outside of those fruits and vegetables because herbicides, they get absorbed by the plant's um, dermis, the leaf, top of the leaf, and then that goes into the meso of the leaf, and it either kills the leaf off or it travels down through the phloem down into the roots. And when it gets down into the roots, it prevents the roots from being able to uptake um, water. And in may, that, that's how many of these things work. Uh, Roundup, for example, is systemic. So that's how it works. It, it travels through the leaf down into the root and kills it off. Now, they, there's a certain allowable amount of herbicide or pesticide that can be found on the plants. And if you were to take the allowable amount of pesticide on any given crop, and then consider how much uh, 
pesticide, that would be after a year of eating pesticide. And then you were to take that over your lifetime and calculate how much pesticide that was. It's still less than the DL50. Now, the DL50 is the amount of pesticide. It's a measurement of the amount of a poison that will kill 50% of the life that's exposed to it, or so 50% of the people exposed to it. So the DL50 for Roundup is, I think it's, well, I'm not going to give a number. I, I have a number in my mind that I think it is, but it's actually greater than coffee. So if you were to consume the amount of coffee that you would have to consume Roundup to kill you, you'd be far less coffee to kill you than, than Roundup. And the same is true for um, a lot of other things. You, sugar would kill you before Roundup would kill you. Now, I, I don't think anybody should eat it, but, um, you know, it really isn't nearly as hazardous as people think it is. And the real hazard with Roundup is not eating a residual because you can just wash that off. The real hazard with Roundup is to the person who's putting the Roundup on the field. And that's where Roundup Ready comes, really makes things better because when we used to put Roundup up on with sprayers and we had to hood the sprayers, you're handling all of that stuff. You're handling the sprayer, you're handling the hood, you're getting off the tractor, adjusting rates of flow. Whereas when you've got Roundup Ready, um, you just take a high crop with a sprayer and you go through and spray the field and it far less human contact, far less human contact. Eric says, what I think is crazy, you can't save your seeds if someone else's crosses with your OP seed. Um, you could save the seed, it may not reproduce, it may not produce what you think it's going to produce. Um, I don't personally save seeds. And, you know, as far as being in shed wars, that's not a real popular position to take. Um, in fact, when I left Will It Grows Live, they were talking about seed saving and they were talking about seed saving being, you know, a great thing. And maybe if you're on a home garden scale, maybe it's a good thing, uh, but it would be way too expensive for me to try to run a seed saving program. And, I'll, and I'll, if, if you're farming, you know, 5,000, 10,000 acres, uh, no way, no way would you want to save your own seeds unless you had a chemist in house. And, and some of the really big farms do, but not five, 10,000 acres. They're not going to have somebody in house. The problem is that the, the germination rates. Um, if you don't save your seeds exactly right, if you don't have them in perfect conditions, if you don't harvest them exactly when they need to be harvested, if you get some that aren't viable, you could plant, like say if I planted in my garden, if I planted cabbage from seed that I had saved and I got only 50% of 50% yield, or maybe I got even a 70% yield. That means that 30% of my row is sitting empty and I've got to weed it. I've got to fertilize it. I've got to cultivate it and I'm not going to get anything from it. Whereas if I buy seed from a reputable seed uh, company, I should be able to expect with most crops, I should be able to expect a 90% germination rate. If I do everything right on my end, I should get a 90% germination rate. One of the exceptions to that would be carrots. Uh, I, I don't know how other people do, but I don't get great germination with carrots. So if you've got five, 10,000 acres of dent corn, you're not going to buy your own seed because you want that seed to be insured. And that's the other thing that these 
uh, GMO seed providers do is they give you an insurance that that seed is going to germinate. And if it doesn't, they give you a new seed. Yep. I, th I think if I were going to save seeds, um, I, I think I'd save pepper seeds and maybe, maybe I'd save some tomato seeds. Um, I don't, I don't really like planting tomatoes. I don't like growing tomatoes. We, we grow them. I think we grew about 150 plants last year. Um, I just, they actually don't sell as well as you would expect. And um, they're pretty acidic, so they're a little harder for me to eat than other things. And they are a nightshade, so if you've got arthritis, they're probably not the best thing to eat. But I just, I don't like the smell of tomato plants. I don't care for tomatoes at all. But what, uh, Eric, what kind of beans are you growing? And have you ever grown rattlesnake beans? I'm going to try and look back here. Um, the reason I ask is we planted, I do pretty good with wax beans. They're the yellow, the yellow wax bean. And uh, last year we did, and I can't even, oh, we did a, uh, a North Carolina pole bean, um, but yard long beans. So I've seen those in the book. I've never, I've never tried growing them. Um, actually they make sense to grow because when you harvest them, the problem with beans is that it's very labor intensive to harvest. If you do bush beans, I think they're a lot harder to harvest uh, than pole beans. So when we do bush beans, well, Mama Goose just pulls them right out of the ground, takes them to the table, and just starts cleaning them right off there. So we get one harvest off of our bean plants, and that's fine. Um, I like the pole beans. We put them up on the Hortonova trellis, and uh, they, they come out pretty good. So maybe I should try the yard long beans. I can't remember where I saw those, if it was over at uh, Haas Tool or if I saw them, maybe I saw them in the Johnny's cattle. I'm sure Johnny's has got them. So uh, if Haas doesn't have them, maybe I'll have to make a Johnny's order. Peas are another one I, I, I'd probably save. Um, I can't grow okra here. Maybe I can. I haven't been successful in growing okra here. I'm going to try it again. Um, Eric, I will hit your page up and watch that video, if not tonight, tomorrow, uh, because I'm, I am interested in that. I, I'd like something that I could do a little bit better with beans. The wax beans, the yellow wax beans are great sellers. The green beans, if, if we pick them just right, then they sell really well. They don't store very well for us. Um, I don't know, maybe the, our, our cooler is set a little bit warmer than it should be. And then it frosts up and we have some problems with that. So I'm trying to get that straightened out before summer comes, uh, but I will try, I will look at your video. But back to okra, I planted okra this year three times. The first time I planted it, I planted it in early May. We had a frost on May 15th. I planted it again um, around May 20th. Uh, it never came up, either time, never came up. Then I read that the ground has to be really warm for okra, which I should have known because it's popular in the South. And so I, um, 
I tried it one more time. Jules from Jules Small Gardening, uh, he sent over some okra seeds for me to try. That was kind of my introduction to shed wars, in fact. And uh, I, I planted them. Uh, I had probably 150 feet planted every 12 inches, and they came up. Uh, and they were looking pretty good. They were about that tall in September. So uh, this year I'm going to try growing them. I'm going to I'm going to plant them. Probably start them mid March in cells, and then uh, hopefully be able to transplant them. Maybe I'll even put them some in a hoop house just so that I have some. I, I do like okra. I like uh, pickled okra. So. Um, Starting, yeah, I'm going to start mine in trays this year as well. Eric, I, I remember you're like in northern Indiana too, right? Like sort of not near the Chicago border, but around uh, Crown Point. Or do I have you mixed up with somebody else? Yeah, he's in Indiana, but we're in Indiana. Because Indiana's like Illinois. You can be north or you can be pretty far south. Swefford Homestead, where where are you at? Oh, that's right. You're all the way down by Terre Haute. We buy potato seed and onion sets. We buy potato seed and onion sets in La Crosse, Indiana, which is, it's pretty far north, I guess. It would be quite a ways north of Terre Haute. But uh, if you want some good onion sets and potato seed, I was amazed. I looked at, uh, you know, um, Haas tools. I forget what they wanted for like 10 potatoes. Uh, I pay $18 for 50 pounds of potato seed. And I can get, in a 50-pound bag of potato seed, I can get 300 foot a row. So that's, you're probably, if, if like this year we lost all of our potatoes to the potato bugs, um, but that's not going to happen again. Um, you should get out of 50 pounds, you should get at least at least 250 pounds return, at least. If you cut them with potatoes, if you plant them whole, you will get a lot of potatoes, but you'll get small potatoes. If you cut them up so that you've got like three eyes per slice and plant them, you'll get fewer potatoes, but much larger potatoes. Now, you probably be 10 inches on center or something like that as you're planting them. But uh, so, Swafford Homestead says Middle Tennessee. If I could move anywhere and start over again, I would go to Tennessee. I'm not sure where in Tennessee, but I would go to Tennessee. Um, it would it would take Herculean effort for me to move my operation anywhere right now. So I think I'm here here for good. Close to the Alabama line. I'm going to be close to the Alabama line in March, but. Uh, not sure when exactly. Uh, we've got some family down that way. So Swafford says you cut your seed potatoes. Um, we've done both. You can buy, a, you've got to buy it commercially, I think. I don't think you can get it in a small uh, bag. But if you're buying 50-pound sacks, of seed potato, you can get B-grade potatoes. 
Now, what a B-grade potato is, is it is a large seed potato, much larger than your A-grade potato. And you don't cut B-grade potatoes. You plant them whole, and you plant them two foot apart. And the idea is that you'll get a lot of small potatoes. And that's good if you're going to plant like, uh, if you want to plant russets, and you're going to dig them as new potatoes. So if you're going to dig them at like 75 days after you count potatoes from the time the potatoes break ground. So if it says 75 days, that means that from the time the bloom breaks ground, the plant breaks ground till the time you can start to harvest or the time you should harvest, um, you, you, um, a 75 day potato is still going to be a new potato. You're not going to want to hold that. You're going to want to, uh, um, you're going to want to use that as a new potato. Yeah. 20 bucks for 50 pounds is, is that's what we pay. And that's what I'd expect to pay. Um, doing redneck things. Take care. God bless. Thanks for stopping in. Yeah. I'd expect to, to pay around 20 bucks. I, I think, I think that's what we pay. It's either 18 or $20 for a 50 pound bag. Uh, the only exception to that, I think, is the Pontiac Reds are a little more expensive. And then they've got a specialty fingerling potato, and they, they charge a little bit extra for that. So that's – now, what do, you, what do you plant for onions? We uh, – I plant from Dixondale. We plant a – an onion transplant, and then I get onion sets from Holland Growers in Indiana, and I get my shallots from Holland Growers in Indiana. Uh, we buy a shallot from them. It's a banana shallot. I think they call it an Australian banana shallot, and um, it is an amazing producer. Uh, you, you plant the shallot. Now shallots don't multiply. You just, you're just growing them out like you would an onion. Uh, so we get shallots that are about that long and about, well, maybe as big around as my little finger. And when we pick those shallots, when we pull them 60 to 120 days, uh, 60 days is about the earliest you want to pull them. Um, uh, but you can go all the way up to 120 days. I, I, wouldn't generally get 120 days here. My, my season's only 140 days, something around there. So, um, but we get, you know, sometimes we'll get shallots that are six inches long and inch and a half around. And I haven't done a really good job of fertilizing onions or shallots. I'm, I'm going to do a better job of that this year. From Baker Creek. Um, yeah, we don't actually, I never had, I, well, last year I did a little test run where I planted some onion seed. This year I'm going to plant onion seeds this week. And I just, I'm going to see how it goes. I'm going to get a, a plug tray and, uh, you know, I, I don't, I think I might have a 120 cell plug tray. I'd like to get something like a 300 cell and uh, plant the onions in that and then probably put them in the ground March or early April. But uh, we have frost up until normally our last frost would be the 15th of April. But like I said before, we had a frost on May 15th. So, um, you know, that's one of the things I like about Alabama. What's that? Do you remember the seed store, the name of it? Caps. We got, there's a place down by my brother-in-law it's called Caps. And they've got a shelf full of bottles of seeds, just like an old pharmacy or well, like the seed shops used to be. And you can buy four ounces. You can buy a pound. Um, I go down there. I buy my my buckwheat cover crop, 
Um, I usually buy 10 pounds and it, it's pretty cheap. I mean, if I bought 50 pound sacks, I'd get it cheaper, but I don't need 50 pounds. And uh, I think we bought iron clay peas and a couple others, but um, we do pretty well. It's, it, it's cheap. We got our zucchini down there. We got our, our cucurbits down there. Pretty much everything I planted last year came from there. You plant, you break the rules, you plant long day onions in September and transplant in October, November, then let them grow to spring. I'm calling the onion police. You're breaking the rules. No, you know, you're probably Tennessee. You're probably, are you intermediate onions or are you short day onion down there? Because I would think like if you're in a high area of Tennessee, um, I would think you'd be able to plant long day onions there. I mean, you're going to get a lot of sunlight. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, I agree. You got to watch the weather. Now I don't care. I'll, I'll sometimes I'll plant, you know, even, um, I'll, I'll plant early and have backup flats and if the frost gets it i'll replant but cabbage usually is going to make the frost broccoli is going to make any frost that we get in may but so you yeah so the only really thing that would be different if you planted like a, a large onion it, it's just not going to bulb up as big if you're short day. Um, you're just not going to get as much bulbing, but you should be fine. You know, you're going to get, you're going to get onions for sure. Now when we plant sets, onion sets, we don't get anything for onions. We get golf ball size onions, but the idea behind onion sets is to sell them as bunching onions. And depending upon how the market is you know last year we didn't get to market till June because we did, or till July because with the frost in May even the stuff that should have been up wasn't up and we had so much rain early in the spring that we couldn't plant anything so have you got Swafford have you got a uh, a video on your onions because I'd love to see what they look like. Um, Onions are kind of, I, I really enjoy planting onions. I, I enjoy everything about it. Yeah, Eric, tomatoes especially will catch up. If there's no point in planting, I mean, I'll have them, I'll, I'll seed them and I'll put them in the greenhouse. I usually put my tomatoes in either a three or a four inch pot and I'll let them grow as big as they want. And then uh, when it's time to move them out, I, I really want the ground to be in that 75 degree range. Um, so you're looking at end of May would be the earliest I'd put tomatoes or peppers into the ground, at least normally. And last year, even in our greenhouse, we had a little problem and uh, we lost our peppers because we had a, a cold night that the greenhouse just didn't keep up with. So okay, I, I will check out your onion video. And with that guys, I'm gonna say good night. It's uh we've been at this for about an hour. I sure appreciate you all stopping by. Um check out the GMO video. If you haven't, uh, take a look at all of the other videos we got and I will be back next week, Tuesday, but next week I'm going to go on at eight o'clock. Um, this week I, I moved it up for a particular reason, but next, next week we'll be on at eight o'clock. So Mitzvah Shem, I'll see you then. I'm Chicken Johnny. Eat your vegetables.